tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I love you and I give you all the glory. I thank you for tonight. I thank you for everybody that's here today. Lord, I pray that you keep the youth safe at the bonfire tonight. And Lord, I just love you and I give you all the glory. In your precious and wonderful name I pray. Amen. He said... to sin and things that confound not of this world shall turn me around daily I'm hurt in glory to God I'm going through yes he set me free yes he broke the bond Amen. Does anybody have a testimony tonight? You're looking at me, brother. Tim, what you got? Well, I think Anybody else? That's it. And uh, keep Cannon in prayer. Uh, he had a little uh, test result come back, but um, my wife would uh, know a little bit more. But it, hopefully, it's nothing, nothing uh, too bad. But um, just keep him in your prayers. And because uh, they, they, we took him for another test result today. So uh, I'm just praying that uh, everything will come back. He's just okay. And uh but yes, keep my son in prayer. <clears throat>
shall soon be so I have one more song to sing, and it's uh, Because He Lives. <clears throat> because He Lives, I Can Face Tomorrow. <clears throat> Brother Tyler, will you come up here and help me? God's. Yes. <laughs> they.
Oh, okay. Youth, you know what to do. Follow that fellow right there with the baseball cap. All right. Well, if you take your Bibles with me, turn to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. I want to go over this with you this evening. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. <clears throat> right there next to the book of Hezekiah. <laughs> book of Ecclesiastes. While you're turning there and you're looking at this portion of Scripture, we're going to be looking at Chapter 5, and chapter 5 is a very, very interesting portion of Scripture because the uh, wisest man in the world wrote it, Solomon did. And while he did, Solomon knew quite a bit about funds and resources. He knew quite a bit about money because he had quite a bit of money. But there are some things here that I want to read with you this evening. And it has to do with, with money. i got to tell you something about money. Money is cold. But the other thing about money is money is a cruel master. Uh, it can be great when you're managing it, but boy, when it starts managing you, it becomes extremely cruel. And I want you to notice a few things that Solomon is going to be talking about. And uh, like I said, money is a great servant, but it is a horrible master. And so when it is what's driving you and moving you and doing all the above, cruelty is all that's going to come from it. I want you to read with me, if you would, because, you know, I was looking at this today and, uh, you know, going along with 2 Corinthians, starting talking about afflictions and problems that come into our lives and all the above. Then I started thinking, one of the greatest afflictions that perhaps we have right now, and concerns, it has to be money. It has to be money with everything that's going on in Europe, everything's going on everywhere else. I mean, it's got to be a concern. Individuals that have their 401ks, their investments, I mean, you have to know that there's some stuff moving around right now. And so as that is going on, I'm not telling you to be foolish with your money, but there are some principles here that have to do with money that Solomon is going to speak on. And I want you to notice what they are. Now, beginning with verse 9, if you would. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 9. Moreover, the prophet of the earth is for all, and the king himself is served by the field. He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase this is also vanity. I want you to notice the first thing. There are seven things, by the way, that Solomon is going to talk about money. The very first one is this. The more we have, the more we want. The more you have, the more you want. That's just, that's just part and parcel of it. But, you know, there's a problem whenever it is. That's what I start loving and longing for. And I start going to try and do more. Like I told you before, Rockefeller, when he was the richest man in the world, was asked, how much more do you need to be happy? He said, just a few dollars more. It's never enough. The more that you have, and I'm not telling you not to be frugal, I'm not telling you not to invest wisely. What I'm saying is, when I start accumulating something, all of a sudden I start doing everything possible to accumulate more. And there are times that I'll bypass a few simple things in pursuit of this. Sometimes I'll bypass my family, sometimes I'll bypass my spouse, Sometimes I'll bypass my service to the Lord, whatever it may be, because I have to keep committing to this, because that's where I feel everything is coming from. And when that happens, things be, yeah, you might have all the things the world promised you would make you happy, but then you start finding out that it doesn't. But I want you to notice a second principle. The, the more you have, the more that we want. Notice the second thing. The Bible says in verse 11, it says, when goods increase, they are increased that eat them, and what good is there to the owners thereof, saving the beholding of them with their eyes? I want you to notice something else. The more we have, the more we spend. I remember one time that uh, I, was, I was in a court, and I used to translate in court in Montgomery County, which is north of Houston. And I remember there was this one lady that came in one time. This is, I'm talking about 19, good grief, 1997. 1997. Good grief, that was 26 years ago. Anyway. So uh, a lot younger then, guys. So I was there, and this lady comes up because a lot of times they wanted a court-appointed attorney. Well, in order to get a court-appointed attorney, you have to qualify. And one of the things you have to qualify is that you're indigent or you're not making enough to
to be able to acquire an attorney that's going to be court appointed. So she comes up, and when she comes up, Judge Winfrey's uh, sitting there, and he says, okay, uh, Judge, I, I need a court appointed attorney. And he looks and he says, but I see that your income is $130,000, not including your husband's income. And she goes, well, Judge, the more we have, the more we spend. <laughs> and he's just looking at her like, Lady, that's not my problem. That's your problem. But isn't it true? How many, I, you know, just growing up in the faith, growing up as a man, you know, as a young man to an older man, how many times I thought to myself, if I could only go past, I remember going to this thing where it was like I was making $5.25 an hour, and I thought to myself, if I could just get to $5.75, boy, everything would change. And then I'd get to $5.75, and it seemed like there was less because I was spending more. You know, it's quite a discipline to be able to bring more. I'll give you another one. You know, there are times that we start, you know, when I'm giving to the Lord, you know, if I'm tithing off a of 550, you know, I can, I can do okay. All of a sudden, I start doing better, and I start giving the Lord more, and all of a sudden, I stop, and I'm just like, good grief, Lord. I, I start seeing things differently. I'm giving you a whole lot more, and I can hear heaven just say, yeah, but I'm giving you a whole lot more. You're just not managing it right. And I want you to think about something he says in this portion of Scripture that wherever there is excess, there becomes something that starts coming into my life and into your life. A strange thing, whenever there's excess, the thing that begins to happen is there also is envy. I start seeing what somebody else has, and I want what they have, or I desire. I, I might not wish them evil, but I just want what they have. I want a little bit more. And the three questions that Solomon is bringing in this portion of Scripture, simple. How do I get my money? That's the first question is, how do I get my money? How do I spend my money? What do I use my money for? In other words, what's, what do I do with it? How do I get it? How do I spend it? How do I accrue it? But how do I spend it? What is it that I do with it? And what are the things that I'm limited to? And what are the things I'm not limited to? There's a third thing that he brings out in a principle. I want you to notice the more, the more I have, the more I spend. But look at verse 12. The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. The more we have, the more we worry. I know individual. I, I told you, I can't tell you the guy's name because you all would know him, but I had a friend of mine in Castorville, and uh, he fell, and when he fell, he broke his, broke his uh, hip, and he was 90, about 93 years old then. And so I'd go, I went to go visit him at the nursing home, and he spoke good Spanish, so I'd sit there and we'd talk, and he's a war veteran and all the above. He had great stories. And so anyway, he had a beautiful house in Castorville. I mean, if I told you a house, every one of you know the house. So anyway, I waited till I'd go see him every day, and, and uh, the, the guy that was next to him couldn't talk and couldn't move. He was, but they would bring him food. And so what my friend would do is he didn't want to see waste. So guess what he'd do? He would get the food, and he'd save it, and he'd forget it. So inside the little drawer, there was a bunch of food in there because he just did not believe in waste. He didn't want to see anything thrown away. And he would forget he put, he put the food there. So anyway, I waited for him to come out, and I went, I'd go visit him every day at his home, and beautiful home, and he had a lady that would help him. And he sits there, and he just, I said, what's wrong? And he says, uh, my water bill went up by $3.25, and I have no idea what I'm going to do. Man, I felt so bad. I started thinking of my mom and dad and how they struggled, and, you know, I quit. And he says, man, I want to go outside so bad, but, you know, I, I don't have a way to get out. If only I had a ramp. I felt so bad for the guy. I went over to the lumber store on credit and went and got all the lumber and started building him a little deck and all the above. And, and you know, he was, oh, man, that's just, that's so great. Thank you, Roland, and all the above. And so anyway, the neighbor comes over and he says, hey, Roland, I didn't know you. Are you a carpenter? With? I said, no, I'm just, you know, I feel sorry for the, you know, he's struggling right now and I just want to make sure I could come, you know, build him a, a deck or a little ramp and he starts laughing starts walking away I said you know what are you laughing at he says you know he's worth 325 million dollars don't you <laughs> and I was like yeah yeah of course I do you know and every time I'd go visit him he'd always call the lady and the lady would come out and he would ask me to step outside and I'd step outside and he would say boy that Roland's a really good fellow make sure he didn't take anything you know I'm like I'm not gonna take nothing but you know, if you've ever been around people that have money and have it in abundance, they're always worried who's going to take what they have. They're always wondering who's going to 
These are individuals that are always calling the bank. If they're 50 cents off, boy, I want to know what happened to my account. I want to know what happened here, what happened there. You know, the less that you have, it's like 50 cents. You know, go ahead and take another one. Who cares? I'm already in the minus. But you start thinking about these individuals. Listen, it's true. When individuals start to accrue, you start to think about everybody trying to take what's yours. You ever seen someone as they get older? As they get older, they start doing this number, and all of a sudden, they just start thinking everybody's after what they got, and you're looking at them like, Grandma, I'm just here to take care of you and bring you some soup. And Yeah, but I know you're after this, and I know you're after this. It's like, good grief. I'm not after anything. Why? Because what happens is when you start to accrue, and that's what I've placed my life, my balance, and everything in, I'm going to protect it because I really do believe everybody's trying to take it away from me. Isn't that a crazy thing that everything in Christianity, we're trying to give away what we have and everything in the world, we're trying to protect what we're not going to have forever. I want you to notice there's a fourth thing that Solomon says. Look at this. This is real interesting. The Bible says in verse 13, there is a sore evil which I have seen under the sun, namely riches kept for the owners thereof to their hurt. But those riches perish by evil travail, and he begetteth a son, and there is none in his hand. I want you to notice, the more we have, the, the more we spend. The more that we have, the more we worry. But the more we have, the more we hoard. You ever met a hoarder? Anybody ever made a hoarder? Uh, I got so many stories on this stuff. I was called out to, you guys know where Carn City's at. Just before that, there's a little town called Pote. If you've ever seen, well, in between both of those, there's nothing out there. And most of them folks are Czechoslovakian or Polish or German by descent, hardworking people. And those individuals, they, whatever they have, they've earned it. They, nobody gave it to them. They're hardworking people. But I went out there. I went out there. Uh, I had a person on, on hospice, and her sister had passed away, and she was, you know, an older lady. And she calls me, and she, she'd call me, Brother Roland. Brother Roland, can you come and you check? And told me the lady's name. And I was like, well, why don't you call the constable? She goes, well, you know, just can you just come out here? So I went out here. Listen, you don't, you don't just drive up to people's property and drive. You're going to get shot, you know? And then if you have my pigmentation, you're going to get shot and stabbed. You know? It's like, <laughs> Be careful, you know? <laughs> so I go into this place, and I drive right up into it, and, you know, there's the gate open, right? You know, because everybody there has a gate. So I go past the gate, and I go in there. Man, I look in the, and I'm knocking, knocking, knocking. Nobody, nobody answers. And I notice the door is open. There's this little old lady. I'm talking about a little frail woman, and she's sitting right there like in a type of lazy boy. And I'm like, Mama, 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 Mama. Yeah. Nothing, nothing registers. She lives by herself. She's there by herself. I'm looking around, and there's boxes, and there's, I mean, you're, you're, you know, trying to get through everything. Well, finally, I get over there, and she's, I mean, doesn't know come here from Sikkim anymore. I mean, she's gone. And so I go over there, and I'm like, Mom, and she's got a thing of peanut butter next to her and a spoon, and it's open, and got a thing of crackers that's open right there. And so I'm already calling, you know, constable so somebody can get over there, welfare check, make sure she's, you know. And then she starts going, babies, babies. And I'm like, oh, you're thinking about your babies, mama? And I'm over here, get over here now. <laughs> and so she starts going, well, all of a sudden, I kind of start seeing some rats. If you've ever been out in the field, field rats are field rats. I mean, and so rats start, they're, well, that's what was eating. She had bites on her leg and everything. So babies, she was making reference to the rats. And so there's a broom there, and I start, I mean, you guys ever hit a rat? They make the most weirdest, crazy screech. It's, I'm telling you. And I'm hitting them, like, and these things are squealing all over the place. I'm like, God. I, I felt like I was in a movie from Ben or Willard. Remember that? I mean, they're everywhere. And so, because it's so nasty in there. So they come, they take her. Let me tell you what happened. What happened is her daughter took care of her. But her daughter went to the mailbox the day before to go retrieve the mail. Had a massive heart attack. And so somebody saw her, called 911. They came and picked her up and whisked. She died in the hospital. Well, nobody thought about going and checking back home to see if anybody was there. So when I came up there, you know, they were going to check on her because, you know, 
Well, the constable's on the way. They come. They call the ambulance and all. They take her to the hospital. She lives two, that lady lives two more days and passes away. The constable calls me and asks me to sign an affidavit. And I'm like, okay, but why? He says, well, you got, you got, a, you got some. So we meet in Floresville. And he says, well, I went over there with the, with the nurse, you know, and the, the constables tell me this. We walked in there, and we're looking for identification, looking for a wallet or something, insurance, Medicare, or whatever, you know, so we can process everything. Well, there's rats rolling. There's rats everywhere. And he says, so we go to her bedroom, and in her bedroom, remember the old foot lockers or the cedar chests where people used to put quilts and stuff? Well, she had one of those. And so I said, well, we don't know. So they opened it up. It was loaded with silver certificate bills, over $2 million in cash. She didn't believe in, she didn't believe in banks. She'd had that there forever. Who knows? And it was worth more because they were silver certificates, and I'm like, Really? You want me to sign that I didn't take it? If it was there, you think it'd still be there? <laughs> I was like, good grief, I signed it. You know, I started thinking about that. And she had one, get this, her, her daughter, but her other daughter had passed and had one son. He was on crack. He was a mess. He was doing all this kind of, well, they were looking for him. He had a warrant, a simple DWI warrant, whatever. Well, they're looking for him because the cash belongs to him. The property belongs, he's the only heir. Well, he took off running because he was so scared. So I have no idea what happened to that money. I have no idea what happened to that individual, but he just took off. You know, I think of that, and I've met a lot of people, you probably have too, that have built up nest eggs or they've held on to their money, especially older people. Some of them would take precious stones or they would invest in but they would look at it and hide it, look at it, and then they'd have a special place to hide it. Uh, you want me to tell you where the best, you want me to tell you where the favorite places are for old people to hide their, the freezer and also their gardens. And if they had chimneys or fireplaces, somewhere around there, everybody's going to go with a metal detector. <laughs> that's, where, that's where people, these, these guys that go look, that's where you find it, because the, they would hide it in coffee cans or things like that. You've heard the stories. You know, there are individuals that have taken, and I'm, I'm speaking bluntly to you, and rather than bless, they've hoarded. And they've kept to them just like this. What's the first question that comes to your mind when you think of that? Let me tell you the first question that comes to mind. What were you planning to do with it? Especially when you're older. I mean, did you think you were going to live forever? Did you? Th I mean, what? were you thinking especially if you have family or there are situations or whatever it may be rather than blessing somebody they hoard it and they it's almost like they put their arms around it and they just won't let anybody near it and they forget all the individuals that literally have loved them cared for all their lives but when it comes to that if money is managing you it can be a cruel master not only a cruel, it'll put things in your head. I'm obviously making money like a person, but it's not. But the thought of having things and saving things. You know, when my father died, when my father passed away, he, there's six of us. He, our, 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 uh, I, I love to say this. And when we planned his estate, uh, we all ended up with $80 each. <laughs> I still have those $80. I won't touch them. I won't spend them. They're just sitting there, and I just remember, and every time I see those dumb uh, $20 bills, I think of my dad. $80. There's individuals that have kept a lot more. But what they do is they hoard it. What a horrible thing to do. But they do. And by the way, save for a rainy day and save for your retirement. That's just smart. But bless along the way as well. Because there will be times when it is your... Uh, I'm, I'm going to reveal something to you that some of you are just going to go, oh, man. <laughs> I love holidays, but I, I think Hallmark has pulled a fast one on everybody. You know, when I see something that I like for my grandson, the thought is, if you'll be good, I'll get it for you in Christmas. Well, if you're good, your birthday's coming up. You know, what I understand is life is short, and if it's in your hand to bless someone, bless them. I'm not going to wait till Christmas. If I see something that I think I like for my grandson, 
I'm just going to get it for him, give it to him. I'm not talking about anything big. It might be a baseball. It might be a football. It might be a hat. But I'm not going to wait till then. I'd rather bless him now. Do you know why? Who said I was going to be here for Christmas? Or even more painful, who said he would be here for Christmas? I'd rather bless him while I can. I run across individuals or whatever it may be. If I have an opportunity, why am I going to wait for that one special day? The special day is now. How many people have you had in your life that were here today and then they were gone and it seemed like all of a sudden one of Shannon's friends was coming back from a glorious trip, her and her husband, it was her father, that her father just passed away, 92 years old. And then she got sick, she's not doing that great, not to death, but she's not doing that great. And her husband has been diagnosed or is about to be diagnosed with dementia. And then she has a couple of other siblings that also, you know what, guys? Life is so brief. Life is so short. If I can bless someone, someone that I love, or so, God put something in my heart, why am I going to wait for the day that Hallmark told me that it was the best day to do it? I'm going to do it while I can. Because, man, I'm alive today. I'm moving around today. I might not be moving around tomorrow, or neither might they. I have this, I have this little box it's probably worth in its glory five dollars. I don't know. You, you remember the little boxes that you wind up and it plays a little music? It's just a little. Well, when my daughter was a baby, or I say a baby, she was younger. I was, a, I was an evangelist. I was out preaching and that's how I started and we'd sing together. But my daughter, every time I concluded a message, she would come up. She's a little girl and she would always sing the song. Thank you. I don't know if you guys remember that song. Thank you for giving to the Lord. And she would sing that song. That little box that I have, that's the tune it plays. Thank you. So, you know, I was looking at it, and I'm like, I'm wrapping that thing up. I'm sending it to my daughter. I think she'd get a bigger kick out of it than, remember something? I'm talking about something that's five bucks. But she'll never forget that I gave her that. You want to build memories with your family, with your friends, with your loved ones, because life is too short. It's just too short, isn't it? And so whatever you're going to do, do it while you have breath, while you have life, while you can do something. Uh, I, went, I was thinking about the, the climbing flowers that Ramona and Vernon gave. We just asked them. I asked, we asked because, you know, they, they have a nursery and they know a lot about plants. So I was asking him, hey, what's, what kind of plant climbs? Well, you can't ask these rascals anything because I'm asking them for information. Next week, they're throwing them in my trunk. You know, it's like, here you go. <laughs> you can have them. And I'm like, I'll buy them. No, no, no. Go. Well, those things are climbing like crazy. You were right. They're going nuts. And they're beautiful. Guess what happens every time I look at those things climbing? I think of Ramona. Isn't that something? I mean, those things, those things, those things are, and I'm just looking, I'm like, I think I'll call her and have her make me a pie. <laughs> and she would. I want you to notice, and by the way, don't ever ask her to do anything if you're not serious, because how long will it take her to get it done? And she'll be calling you, won't she? And she'll be calling you. He calls her buckwheat. I thought that was fun. I call her Sophia Loren. <laughs> I want you to notice two other things. Look at this. Look at this. So when you look at this portion of the scripture, as Solomon is writing, he says, listen, the more we have, the more we want. The more, the more that I have, the more that I spend. The more we have, the more we worry. The more that we have, the more that we hoard. But notice what the Bible says in verse 15. And he came forth of his mother's womb naked. Shall he return to go as he came? And shall take nothing of his labor which he may carry away in his hand. The more we have, the more we leave. Fast in, fast out. It happens that fast. What does the Bible say? You know, when Alexander the Great died and he was dying, he made three requests. One of them was this Have my, hang, my arms hanging as you're carrying me. And they asked the General, why? He says, so that everybody knows that naked came I into the world, naked did I leave. You know, when I held uh, Cesar, when Cesar was born, I remember that I just tapped my finger on his, on his palm. You know what he did? So did Lily, so did Perla. They, 
Have you ever, a baby, you just put your finger right there? It's almost like a, like a, like a mouse trap. Boy, they just grab your finger. You ever held the hand of somebody that dies? It opens. Man comes into this life grabbing as much as he can. But I have news for you. When you and I leave this world, our hands are open. Because you didn't bring nothing into this world, you're taking nothing with you. The only thing you're taking, the only thing that's following you is what you did for Christ. That's the only thing that's going to follow you. But as far as obtaining things, I'm going to stay right here. I want you to notice that Solomon says in this portion of Scripture, and if you ever wondered where it is, there it is. It's in Ecclesiastes. When I came into this world, I was naked, and I'm going to leave this world, and when I leave this world, I'm going to take nothing with me. So the, the more, the more, the more we have, the more we leave. But there's another two thing, another thing very quickly. Notice verse 18. Behold, that which I have seen, it is good and comely for one to eat and to drink, and to enjoy the good of all his labor, that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which God giveth him, for it is his portion. God gives work as a gift. I hope you know that. Sometimes you have to wear. Well, <laughs> I have to get on this dumb traffic. <laughs> you know your job is a gift from God? And if you start seeing it like that and treating it like that and pursuing it like that, you'd start pursuing things and actually start excelling above everybody else. Because if I start thinking what I have and the job that I have, I deal with people all day long, and I'm talking about some nasty rascals. Boy, they, they just, boy, they let me have it, especially because people are dying, and everybody deserves the right. I have the right, and I'm just sitting there just a smiling away, you know. And uh, you know what I start thinking? What a beautiful opportunity to minister to people in whatever situation, whatever state I find myself in, that I might be able to service individuals. You know what? You and I never have a clue, the person that's next to me or in front of me, what they're going through. I have no clue what they're going through. Neither do you. Now, some people will tell you, but a lot of people are private. Most of us here are private. And we're not just going to start talking to strangers and start telling them all our woes. And i got to tell you, there's a lot of things that our hearts are heavy, and we just keep doing it. When I, first, when I first went out on this, this uh, I went out as a chaplain visit, and it said, it said, do not visit. Do not want a chaplain. But what did I do? <laughs> My count was low, and I said, I needed to build. So I go there right off of a couple street. I go and I knock on the door. Well, it said, but I didn't read it because I, you know, in the front it said, do not knock on the front door because it's locked. They have it locked. Well, what am I doing? I'm knocking on the front door. So the lady pulls her head out the side and says, well, what do you want? And I was like, calm down. Chaplain visit. <laughs> Man, oh, if that lady was talking to me in sign language, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> I go back there, and a cold front had just blown in. I mean, it was a cold, cold, and it had just come in. And uh, so anyway, I go back there, and she goes, I said, I said, Mama, it's cold out here. Can I come inside? And she goes, well, oh, go ahead. You know, so I walk inside, and then she starts to tell me again. And she starts to tell me, I already said, I said, it's really cold. She said, you got any coffee? She goes, well, I got enough for a cup. And I'm over there in the cupboard and getting a cup of coffee. And then she's there, and she's kind of like, I, and she said, like I said, I said, you got anything to eat? She goes, well, I was just about to eat a taco. I said, well, let me cut it in half, and let's split it. And so she's looking at me, and, I, and then I start telling her, I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm not here to change your religion or anything. I said, have you seen a, they were Catholic. Has a priest come by? And he says, I said, would you like for me to bring you one? And she goes, boy, that would be really good. I said, do you want him to bring communion and, you know, the rosary and all? And she goes, oh, my God, that would be fantastic. Is that what you do? I said, yeah, that's what I do. I'm here to come. And I'm eating her taco and drinking her coffee. Well, she, she looks and she, she puts, her finger, puts her finger out. She says it in different words. But she says, don't you tell me nothing about that counseling stuff. Don't you try to counsel me. I'm like, no, no, no. Five minutes later, she's sitting there laying down on the sofa with the pillow behind. She says, it all began when mother didn't let me have that puppy. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're, she starts, let me, let me tell you what I'm, all that to tell you this, while she's talking, the day my husband was diagnosed with end-stage lung cancer, my daughter was killed in a car wreck 
and I have two teenage grandchildren. The same day they came home from the oncologist and said, you have about three months to live. My husband of 55 years. Two hours later, I get a knock on the door to be told that my daughter was killed in a car wreck. You know, that lady was nasty for a reason. I didn't know what it was. She didn't go around telling everybody what it was. But it's real funny when you take the time to just wait and ask. There's a lot of times folks will tell you what's bugging them. And they're carrying the, wor the world on their shoulders. And while they're carrying the world on their shoulders, guess what? Here you are. Here I am. And we have the opportunity to pray with him. You know, I actually, I actually ended up leading that man to the Lord before he died. She came to the Lord. I did his funeral. And I ate at her house every Tuesday for about two years before she got sick and died. It's amazing what people will open up to if you just ask. You know what that is? That seeing what I do in everyday life is a gift from God. Whatever it is that you do, whatever it is we do in life, our marriages, our relationships, everything, they're gifts from God. Everything we have is a gift. And if I see everything that comes into my life as a gift, how are you when you're being given a whole bunch of packages and gifts? The kid comes out of you, doesn't it? You start, oh, man, I got another gift. Oh, I got a great gift, even better gift, all of the above. If we start seeing each other, start seeing life that way, and everything comes into my life, even trials and tribulations, if I saw them as a gift, I know that's hard to see. But if I'm a Christian, I believe that a trial is going to bring out the best in me, going to bring out the best in God. That's quite a gift. And that's going to make me grow in the knowledge and the grace of Christ Jesus. Boy, that's a great gift. The final thing is this. Look at this. The Bible says in verse 19 through 20, Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth, and hath given him power to eat thereof and to take his portion, and to rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God, for he shall not much remember the days of his life, because God answereth him in the joy of his heart. God gives wealth as a gift, gives jobs as a gift. But I got to tell you something. If you've been blessed to be able to have the wisdom to invest wisely, and God has given you the opportunities to be able to educate and do whatever it is, and whatever God would have you to do, I have news for you. God gave you that. God gave you that wisdom. God will give you that wisdom. You know, one of my, you guys know this, one of my best friends is Mike Luhan. Mike Luhan was military. He was out in Turkey in the Air Force and all the above. He was so indebted. I mean, his wife worked at Walmart and he worked as a security guard. He's making about $5.25 an hour for USA. He was a security guard. And he just started asking God, you know, God, bless me. And so he read, he read a book on computers. I'll ask him exactly which one. And he just started getting into it. He started getting into it. He started giving his first fruits unto the Lord. And he said, my first times that I did that, I didn't want to. And he says, now I can't afford not to. And man, God started blessing him. Five years later, he opened a company. And he contracted with USA, contracted with others. And it was a consulting firm from that book somebody left behind. Let me tell you what I'm telling you. Sometimes we have these dreams and aspirations. If you'll be found faithful in the things of God, God will open doors that you didn't even know were there. And if you will make God the priority, not money, if you will make God the priority and make God the most essential element of your life, why wouldn't he give you more? Laterno. I don't know if you've ever heard of Mr. Laterno. Mr. Laterno is the individual that had the blueprints for earth moving equipment. He got that in a dream, by the way. He was dreaming and he just started thinking the arm of a man digging. And so he started drawing up these earth moving. So you see all this earth moving. He's the guy that started all that. Well, he in his dream got up and he started drawing the diagrams of how to build these machines. And then he told God he, you know, drew, drew them up, put it there. And he says, God, I know you're going to bless me. And I'm going to let you know right now, I'll live off of 10% of what you give me and I'll give 90% to your work. Do you know that the first year he took home $4 million? I'm talking about post-depression. He took home $4 million and he was asked, but you gave away 90%. He goes, if I can't live off of $4 million, something's wrong with me. So hospitals and colleges 
and ministries birth from all that. And he's, he's the guy that's known. I'll live off of the 10 and I'll give God the 90 because God's, I, I don't even deserve the 10. And God blessed them beyond measure. You know what it is that I'm telling you is you as a Christian are already blessed beyond measure. And you are joint heirs together with Christ. Can you imagine that? You are joint heirs together with Christ. And I was talking to Shannon today and I asked her, what are the three biggest events that usually come into the life of a human being? The three biggest events. Let me tell you what they are. Holding that first child, that's a big event. Marrying that husband or that wife, that's a huge event. Buying that first house, that's a big event. Those are big events. How much attention and how much priority do those three events have? I'm, I'm telling you, all these three things are precious. I'm not downplaying them. But how much do we put in those things? You have pictures on the wall. We have photo albums that are this thick. We, we have all the above. And those three events are just life-changing. They are just events that will just change the life of it. First child you hold in your arms, and you're saying, I do. Even when you're saying, I don't. <laughs> And then the other thing is, boy, when I buy that first big investment, which is a house, how do those three things compare to the creator of the universe taking up residence inside of you and saving your soul? And yet sometimes we don't even have one image of him in our lives, in our homes, in our wallets, or anything. We claim it. Those three events are massive in the life of the human but in comparison to Jesus Christ saving my soul and taking up residence inside of me. And yet this is the one that gets all the applause, attention, nerves, and I don't want to lose it. I want to make sure it's taken care of. Is this not the greater thing? And does this not bless and enhance all of these? You see, if I bring that child to him, that's the first step. If I bring that home and say, this home belongs to you, Lord, if I take that spouse, that partner, and I bring my marriage to him, is that not the greater investment? It's not saying God is telling you, forget your family and your house. No, no, no. What I'm saying is let all of these things pertain to him and make that the dominant force in your life. Your home, your house will become a home. Your marriage will become a covenant. And your children will become servants of God. And I got news for you. The older you get, out of all those three, the only thing that matters is for my children to serve the Lord, and that's, that's the thing that weighs on me. That's me. As long as they're serving the Lord, and as long as they would love the Lord, boy, you can have whatever you want, as long as I could see that. And the older you get, then it spills over to the grandchildren. It's like, oh, God, use them. God, bless them. Do what only you can do, God. Money is... A great resource it's a cruel master so be careful be careful to not let the coldness of money begin to govern your decisions your worry your anxiety everything you need you have a master that has more than enough to be able to provide everything that we need and not only will he provide it it wouldn't hurt let me tell you what my daddy always said Thank you still goes a long way. It wouldn't hurt every time you get that paycheck or every time you, it wouldn't hurt to just get into a little room by yourself and just say, God, thank you. What I have received comes from you. That, isn't that why when we eat, we pray? We're recognizing that what I'm eating came from the Lord. Hey, the next time that you're out, you know, rejoicing with brethren or, or hugging someone's neck, think that God's the one that brought that person into your life. Thank you still goes a long way in whatever God gives us. And when you hold your wife, you hold your husband, you hold your children, you hold your friends, you'd better know God's the one that brought them into your life. So treat them a lot more precious than valuable jewels and stone because they are much more valuable than the coldness of money. Money will come and go. It'll come and go. Trust me, it'll come and go. God doesn't. He just Father, we thank you for the love of Christ Jesus and your goodness. When I think of how good you've been to me, dear Lord, 
I just can't believe it. But I'm not the only one here that thinks like that, dear Lord. I've heard my brethren say the same thing. I've heard it in song, in Sunday school lessons. I've heard it in testimonies. I've heard it in conversation. Dear God, if there's one thing that we are, dear Lord, is we are grateful. And Father, there's things that have come into our lives. There's times that, boy, it has come in in abundance and it's done what it's supposed to do. There's other times that it's been scarce, dear Lord. Help us to be found content in whatever state we're in. And dear God, help us to remember and to always be mindful that everything that comes to our lives, it comes from you. Thank you for the gift of our spouses. Thank you for the gift of children. Thank you for the gift of dear friends that we call brethren. Thank you, dear God, for the very food that we partake of every day because it came from you. And dear God, we are, we are mindful of this and we're letting you know everything that has come into my life, the gas that's in my car and the wheels that, dear God, there isn't anything in my life, there isn't anything in our lives that didn't come from you. Help me to be careful, dear Lord, to remember that it came from you. Help me to be grateful in everything that comes into my life. And dear God, let me be extremely, extremely careful to give you the glory for everything that comes into my life. Dear Father, we love you. We thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for sending your Son for us. That Jesus has given unto us a gift, dear Father, that not a one of us has deserved. We have a gift that none of us, dear God, merited, but we have obtained it through your grace. So, Father, bless. Speak to our lives, dear God. Lead us and guide us as only you can. Thank you for loving us the way that you do. And Father, we thank you. We bless you for all of these things and many more. And Father, we thank you in the blessed and holy name of Jesus. Amen and amen. I, I had something to ask you guys, and that was uh, put our flags up. So we, do, we are privileged to have a couple Marines <laughs> and a Navy man. Who else is it? Were you, you were in the military too, weren't you? You were Army and a police officer how many years? 28 years. And so uh, we're very blessed. So uh, we were given a couple of flags. If you hadn't seen them, they're kind of a little torn up. And so we saved them till today because it rained, and rain and flags just don't mix. So anyway, our service is over, but I was going to ask you guys if we could, Doug, if you'd help us, and Russ, if you'd help us. I still love old glory, brother. <laughs> so you guys want to go outside and join us?